Good afternoon, uh, or good morning. Uh, I'm Ian Lesser from GMF in Brussels, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to thank you for joining us today for this discussion on From the Mediterranean to the Black Sea, Turkey's Troubled Waters. Uh, and to say at the outset, it's really a wonderful pleasure to be able to do this with Rome Med and with our friends at ESPE. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, group of people with us to start off our conversation on this topic this morning. But just to say, um, the notion of troubled waters, I think, really uh, maybe even understates the situation that Turkey and, and we find ourselves in. Um, Turkey is obviously a leading stakeholder in Black Sea security also in the Mediterranean. Uh, in a sense, I think the Ukraine conflict has taken us from a place in which the Black Sea, at least, was a bit of a strategic backwater. We could talk about that. Uh, the Mediterranean, perhaps a little less so, but still, uh, the Black Sea, in any case, is now very, very central to security concerns on both sides of the Atlantic and obviously to Turkey. Turkey's playing a very key role in uh, diplomacy over the conflict as well. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, but I think our conversation will also allow us to talk a little bit about the connections between the Black Sea and security in the Mediterranean, and maybe also the, uh, the nexus between what is happening, broadly speaking, in Europe's east and in the south. Uh, these uh, are no longer disconnected strategic spaces. I think they're connected in a, in a more and more intimate way, but we get to, to talk about that. We've got a great group, as I say, to talk about it. I'm going to let our moderator introduce them to you, uh, but I'm also going to thank uh, ISPI again, but also uh, introduce our moderator, who is Valeria Talbot, who is co-head of Middle East and North Africa a Center at ISPI uh, and an old friend of GMF. It's great to be able to work with you again. It's great to have this conversation. Valeria, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian, and uh, welcome uh, also from, uh, from my side to this virtual panel organized by ESP and GMF in the framework of uh, Rome-Med Mediterranean Dialogues. Thank you uh, to GMF, to all colleagues from GMF for uh, their cooperation in the organization of, of this panel. We will focus uh, this afternoon on uh, the implication of the war uh, in uh, Ukraine on the Black Sea security, and uh, we will see how uh, this uh, affects Turkey's uh, foreign and security policy, both uh, in the Black Sea region and in the Mediterranean. And we will see also the implication on uh, Ankara's uh, relations uh, uh, between uh, with NATO and the United States on one side and with Russia on the other side. I'm delighted to uh, introduce our distinguished speakers. Mitat Celikpala, Professor of International Relations at the Kadira University in Istanbul. Welcome. Stephen J. Flanagan, Senior Political Scientist at the RAND Co Corporation, welcome. And uh, Al Alina Inaye, Director of the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation at the GMF. So thank you uh, for uh, being with us. So in these days, uh, uh, Turkey is uh, uh, under the spotlight uh, for hosting peace talks uh, between uh, Russia and uh, Ukrainian uh, delegations. Indeed, Turkey leveraging uh, on good relations with both uh, uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine has emerged as the main facilitator between Moscow and Kiev uh, uh, and uh, in trying to, to foster peace talks. So what are the implications uh, of this war for Turkey at the geopolitical, strategic and the economic level? I would like to start uh, uh, with uh, uh, Mitat uh, Celikpala and uh, the question to you Mitat is uh, how does uh, Ankara look at possible changes uh, in the Black Sea security and uh, equilibrium as a result of the war uh, in Ukraine. Mitat, the floor uh, is yours. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Valeria. It's my pleasure and honor always to be a part of uh, such a kind of a timely event. And it's also a pleasure together with colleagues and old friends to discuss Turkey and, of course, Black Sea and the Mediterranean. Uh, as, as Ian Lesser mentioned, Turkey is at the heart of Europe's east and south in terms of security, because, you know, Europe's south uh, means Turkey's south as well, and Turkey is part of this Black Sea security environment, as well as the uh, eastern and Mediterranean uh, security environment. Uh, therefore, in the, the first uh, round, as you asked me, to what's the Turkey's position in the north, uh, and then in the second, I try to link it to the uh, to, to the south. And for this Ukrainian stuff, and Turkey had been actively pursuing a kind of a diplomatic solution uh, to forestall a conflict since the war had broken between its two neighbors or partners to the north across the Black Sea. Uh, those are Turkey's neighbors and partners, as you mentioned. And from the beginning, Turkey's initial reaction to Russia's attack uh, on Ukraine was that Moscow's decision and uh, stance were unacceptable and Ankara rejected openly. And Turkey stood against any decision targeting Ukraine's sovereignty and conveyed a message uh, to support Kiev. And this is very quick response. And it was the initial surprise for many uh, regarding Turkey's attitude, very current attitudes that we say. And subsequently, Ankara received Ukraine's official request to close the Turkish Straits to Russian ships. And then comes Turkey's decision to close the Turkish Straits to the both of the Black Sea littorals uh, and offer to mediate or more truly facilitate between Russia and Ukraine. And this is a sea change to, to implement uh, the, the Montreal Convention by Turkey and to, to declare that this is a war between two littorals. And it has some direct effects on the Black Sea security uh, regime, as well as Turkey's Black Sea security narrative as well. This is the first important thing that I would like to raise. And Turkey considered the situation in Ukraine officially as a war and implemented the Montreux Convention. This is very serious. Then, uh, of course, if you would like to discuss the issue from a perspective, Turkey has centuries old experience confronting and cooperating with Russia. We are experienced enough and we have unique relations with Kiev and Ankara has been outspoken supporter of Ukraine's territorial integrity and critic of Russia's annexation of Crimea. And this is also important and it has direct effects on Turkey's policies uh, towards the Turkic world, especially Crimean Tatars. And it is also linked with the security environment within the Black Sea region. Uh, and we know that Turkey developed an effective program of cooperation with Kiev on military technology while retaining effective relations with Russia on energy, agricultural trade, tourism and some other key defense technologies. This is also under severe effect of Ukrainian uh, occupation, uh, Russian occupation of Ukraine, let me say. Uh, and considering Ankara's security concerns and its Western identity as a NATO member, uh, Turkey's general approach to Russia shifted towards a more competitive path than a cooperative one. This is a new phenomenon as well. And seeing the nuclear aspect of the situation and heavy Western sanctions imposed on Moscow, it is not wrong to say that a long and challenging process is awaits Ankara in the near future. And this is also an important development. Uh, in this context, how can we define uh, the situation in the Black Sea? And this is the end of a Turkish narrative of regional ownership. It is already that with Crimea and Georgia, of course, but this is the last nail on the coffin for Turkey. We cannot speak about the regional ownership scheme from then on. And it seems that Russia turning the Black Sea into a Russian lake, and this is not my word, Erdogan tried once, that this is a kind of a movement or move to make the Black Sea a kind of a Russian lake. Uh, he cited NATO's un un insufficient presence to control the main bulk of Black Sea coastline. We will see what kind of a NATO and security environment will be prevailing over in the next coming days. This is a big question mark we have to discuss. What about A2 uh, AD capabilities of Russia as well? 
This is also an important development because, you know, uh, since the annexation of Crimea in 2014, uh, Russia deployed anti-access and area denial capabilities and missile systems there, largely establishing a superiority in the maritime and air domains. Therefore, we need to forget about the, the, the literals and the cooperation schemes. Uh, and of course, economic issues are so very important. The energy-related topics will affect Turkey's Black Sea policy in the coming future. Uh, therefore, we have to be careful on those issues. And then to the end, I may say that in the first round, uh, we have to follow Turkey from this perspective. What will be Turkey's policies over the, the, the straits, Turkish straits, to follow the Montreal Convention and how to balance Russia's activities? This is the most important aspect of it. And the other literals and NATO member countries, Turkey needs to work together with those NATO countries. Therefore, we are in need of developing such a kind of a new security perspective, NATO perspective to attract Turkey. Uh, and most probably we are going to discuss this narrative in the near future as well. Uh, what about NATO's capabilities in the region and shortfalls? This is also an important thing because Turkey is the biggest actor in terms of maritime uh, and of course, land power capabilities to balance Russia in the region, how to attract Turkey to develop a new narrative together with the participation of other literals uh, that we have to concentrate on on the near future. And it seems that some people in circles has just started to discuss those issues from this perspective in, in, in Turkey. Uh, the last word, of course, there are a couple of uh, NATO and the US skeptics still in Turkey. Therefore, how to resolve those issues and to bring the parties all together, this is another issue. And I see the Eastern Mediterranean as a starter to normalize Turkey, to gain Turkey's, I don't know, uh, standard or historical uh, stance as a NATO member country, a European power. Uh, and I'm going to give some details in the second round related to this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitat. Uh, very clear picture. You raised many important uh, points uh, and, uh, and questions. And one of these relates to uh, relations with uh, the US and NATO. How is the war in Ukraine affecting uh, relations between Turkey and its NATO allies? Uh, this question uh, is to uh, Stephen uh, Flanagan. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Talbot, and uh, I'll be happy to pick up uh, echoing some of the points that Professor Celikpala has already uh, mentioned. But I think the first thing to say about the, certainly the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia's invasion has highlighted in Washington and other NATO capitals Turkey's importance in maintaining security in the Black Sea. And, and Professor Celikpala uh, noted a number of the reasons why. Uh, clearly closing the straits, albeit after the Russians moved key naval and amphibious capabilities in the Black Sea, uh, I think there was a recognition in Washington and elsewhere that if it had done that before the Russians had actually attacked, it would have been seen perhaps as a declaration of war against Russia. But, but now hinting at broader restrictions, at tighter uh, implementation of Montreux, as was discussed in the first presentation, I think that uh, highlights uh, another area where Turkey can play an important uh, an important role going forward. Um, but uh, but also it has maintained its security cooperation with Ukraine in the face of Russian uh, Russian pressure and, and objections. Uh, Turkey has continued somewhat this balancing strategy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and Russia and NATO and Russia and the Black Sea. Uh, clearly seeking to demonstrate that by issuing sanctions and harsh rhetoric towards Russia can play this role as a, as a broker of peace talks while still being a, a loyal NATO ally in the region uh, and can still play uh, an important role in long-term uh, security uh, in the Black Sea region. And I think there are some signs that this strategy, coupled of course with the unifying effects of Russian aggression, uh, are having some impact. Uh, I would never have predicted that uh, a proposal, a joint proposal of France, Greece, and Turkey to uh, uh, undertake a humanitarian evacuation of the residents of Mariupol a few weeks ago, 
So I think that's that's showing that um, that uh, Turkey, uh, this role that Turkey is seeking to portray, that uh, both being an interlocutor with Moscow and, and a time of great strain, but also uh, being a loyal ally and and and, and seeking uh, to to play a, a role in in enhancing longer term stability. And it echoes some aspects of Turkish policy going back. One could think. Uh, some of these same strains were evident during the uh, Russian uh, invasion of Georgia in 2008. Um, of course, before the war, Ankara had been casting its mutually beneficial defense, trade, uh, and investment relationship with Ukraine as support for Ukrainian integration into NATO. Um, and of course, this was an important um, uh, it was an important market for Turkey uh, at the time when the Turkish defense industry. Uh, the presidency of defense industry and, and others were uh, in Turkey were under sanctions from the United States because of the S-400 purchase. Um, but uh, but I think uh, it certainly uh, by no means has uh, sort of are all things forgiven in Washington uh, in terms of lingering concerns about Turkey's relationships with Russia, particularly the the defense relationship and the S S-400. I think Turkey would still have to take some concrete actions on that score. But I think there is this growing recognition that Turkey will play an, an important and even more important role in defense of other allies in the Black Sea region and uh, in Romania and Bulgaria, but also support to partners over the longer term uh, in, uh, in terms of the post-war situation. Uh, and it really does present Turkey, I think, with an opportunity to reset its relations with the United States and other NATO allies. Uh, the outcome of the of the Russia Ukraine uh, conflict and, and and perhaps these peace negotiations will have an impact uh, certainly on uh, Turkey's long term strategy as to whether it will uh, pursue a, an approach of a much more robust deterrence strategy and in support of NATO efforts to deter further Russian aggression, or will it continue to try to play a bit of this balancing role of not going too far. Uh, showing that it's still willing to support NATO uh, activities and operations in the Black Sea region, but but not going too far uh, out of fear of provoking uh, an adverse, a further adverse Russian reaction or aggression towards it, or pressure against it in other areas such as Syria. So I, I think we still have to to see a few more cards to play in in gaming out where this will go. But as I say, I do think my, my main point would be is that this is an opportunity for, for Turkey to, uh, if not a complete reset, but certainly a, uh, a, a, an improvement of relations with its other NATO allies, uh, and that uh, there are some opportunities here. And the question is, what, uh, what also will Turkey be seeking uh, in terms of uh, undertaking some of these uh, policies in the post-war period? And we can talk about that in the second round of questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very important uh, point, uh, the possibility of a reset of uh, relations between uh, Turkey and the uh, United States uh, and NATO. And, uh, but let's come to the complex uh, relations uh, between Turkey and, uh, and Russia and uh, to see how this war is affecting the relationship uh, and also uh, to see how long uh, is Turkey's uh, difficult balancing act between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine sustainable. This question is uh, uh, to, to Alina, so please Alina, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Before um, answering the question, I do want to pick up on the issue of the balancing act because Turkey is playing a balancing act not only in the Black Sea region, but uh, but uh, um, it's it's playing a, a balancing act with all of its neighbors. Turkey has gone back to the uh, zero problems with neighbor policy, and in the last year, if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> has made important steps to, to, uh, to come to better terms with uh, Armenia, with Israel, with Egypt, with the United um, Arab Emirates, with Saudi Arabia. Uh, so we see, we see um, um, a balancing act, as you were saying, not, not only when it comes to its relation with Russia, Ukraine, and respectively NATO and the US, but uh, really around 
360 degrees around um, around Turkey. Um, and I think this is the context in which we have to look at what Turkey is uh, is doing in the Black Sea and its relation both with Russia and um, and with Ukraine and how how it's uh, how it's playing this. Um, I don't. I don't see the relation with Russia um, has changed before the war. It has remained the same powerful, strong and transactional relation that it's always been. Um, friendly at times, somewhat hostile at times, depending on the events. But Russia and Tur uh, well, Turkey and Russia, let's put it this way, they continue to have uh, joint common interests not in the Black Sea necessarily, but definitely in, um, in Syria. And Turkey continues to have, uh, um, both of them actually have economic interest in each other. So this hasn't changed, hasn't been at least yet affected by the war. And this is one of the reasons why Turkey um, has been opposing the, the, the sanctions um, imposed, uh, imposed to Russia. Um, if the events as the events unfold, rather, I see no reason why Turkey won't be able to play this balancing act between Russia and Ukraine, because this is the second part of your question. Um, on the long term, Turkey has a, has actually been pretty good at, at playing uh, balancing acts with with, uh, with different countries, even opposing countries. So I see no reason why this is this isn't sustainable. Um, Turkey is very good at pursuing its own interest. It has a strong interest. Uh, in a good relation with Russia, as it was described here, and as I mentioned earlier, but it also has a good interest, um, has ha, yeah, has a strong interest in good relations with Ukraine because of the issues with the Crimean Tatars, because of um, of all the other relations that have been going on between between Turkey and Ukraine. So I I, I see this balancing act actually. Um, I see Turkey being able to play this this balancing act at least on, on a medium term, if not uh, if not on long, longer term. Thank you, Alina. Um, I would like to invite uh, all uh, people from the audience who would like to uh, send their questions to uh, write the question uh, on uh, our social uh, channels. And we will uh, um, have at the end of the panel a, a specific uh, room for, uh, to address your, your questions. So uh, yeah, uh, Alina said we are uh, um, Turkey is uh, an, uh, in uh, is a uh, reshaping uh, its uh, foreign policy, starting from the neighborhood. Uh, we we see uh, normalizations attempts with uh, uh, some uh, countries uh, fr from the Middle East, for example, Israel, uh, Emir United Arab Emirates, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. There are talks also uh, with uh, Egypt. So uh, in uh, the Mediterranean, uh, in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, what are uh, the implications of uh, possible, possible changes uh, in Turkey's uh, foreign policy? Mithat, uh, I'd like to address this question uh, to you. Uh, yeah, okay, Valeria, it's the point. In fact, uh, as Mr. Flanagan mentioned, opportunities for Turkey to reset the relations uh, mainly Turkish uh, cir Turkey circles in Turkey called it as an, as the normalization instead of using the reset because you know many people say that we are part of NATO we comply with the basics of the NATO our Western allies do not understand Turkey's interests and priorities therefore it is the normalization because our partners started to understand Turkey's position uh, or, or what how, how what how fragile is it and this is the reason why. Maybe I, I agree with Alina and Turkey follows its own interest, but of course the style and the manner time to time is an issue, but you know, this is a domestic issue as well. Therefore, I don't want to touch this issue at that moment. Maybe questions and answers I may try to. And it is true as well. Turkey's balancing act is come under under heavy pressure because of this Russian attitude. And Turkey needs to find some realist ways to, to balance it and to normalize it. And therefore it triggers a kind of a sense of rea realism, both in Turkey 
and and the, and with the other partners as well. This is the reason why we see Turkey, Greece, and other French partners are acting together in, in on some issues. This is a good 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 sign of developments. In terms of MENA region, uh, you know, especially the Eastern Mediterranean has occupied a prominent place on an international security and global uh, political agendas over the past decades. And Turkey was always the other in this equation, especially uh, this, this delimitation, energy cooperation whatsoever. But, you know, a more general geopolitical and strategic confrontation centered on the Eastern Mediterranean since 2018 and Eastern Mediterranean became become a kind of an eye of gathering geopolitical storm. This tense competition has been elevated to a phase of escalation with this civil war in Libya, the sign agreements between various regional players on maritime boundaries uh, that exclude or distance others. This was the issue, and most of the time Turkey was the other. And reciprocal and mutually exclusive NAPTEX announcements, high-pitched political statements, those are the issues. In some, the region turned into a kind of a ticking geopolitical time bomb uh, with a potential of spillover effects for broader conflicts. But now, we are witnessing reflections of these current developments, uh, including the, the invasion of uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine on the long term security and stability of the region. They have some direct effects. Uh, for example, there are div important developments from Turkish perspective. Uh, the US non paper on the East Med pipeline, this is important thing. Uh, Turkey's new approach to normalizing its relations with Israel and Egypt. Resumption of Turkish Greek explore, exploratory talks uh, are the current developments and the rising hopes for the de-escalation. And you may add the Israeli rapprochement and President's visit to, to this equation as well. Uh, synergies between the Gulf, the Middle East, and the Eastern Mediterranean theaters have grown substantially. This is very important. And developments ranging from the Libyan civil war to the Abraham Accords have created a kind of a space in which the strategic approaches of the Eastern Mediterranean, Middle East, and the Gulf states seems to be more interwoven than ever before. This is a development. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine as a new game changer in the international politics uh, made the global and regional security environment more complex with some direct reflections on this Eastern Mediterranean issue. Uh, and we have witnessing a kind of an, a new era. It is the era of de-escalation after an almost four year long escalation period in this Mediterranean since late 2021. Uh, Russia's aggressive assertiveness and invasion of Ukraine, economic crisis uh, and increasing energy prices among the main denominators of the current shift. Uh, and I see these factors necessitate eventful period, if not the resolution of issues in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, we may witness more US and EU efforts forcing parties to turn more functional partnership models in the Eastern Mediterranean. Those functional partnership models are the utmost importance for Turkey. Uh, and we see the near future more, I don't know, uh, I'm a little bit uh, optimistic in terms of relations and to link the regions all together. Uh, most probably after Greece and Israel, uh, Cairo is on the road uh, in, in, in Turkey's list. Uh, and op Ankara openly calls for Eastern Mediterranean Conference to find a win-win formula. I see the similar uh, in, uh, uh, signs in the EU and the US as well. If the parties manage to get together to discuss those issue, issues, then most probably we may move forward and the EU Council's idea is to convene multilateral conference for the Eastern Mediterranean. There is a kind of a convergence of policy proposals and interests among the parties, and this is a positive sign of it. Thank you, Mitat. So, do you think that uh, um, uh, we are uh, seeing a, a sort of a return to the um, uh, policy of uh, uh, zero problems uh, with neighbors? Uh, th there is, uh, I don't know whether it's a kind of a zero problems with neighbors or to, to control those problems. You know, the parties, the, the opposite side is also giving some positive reflections. For example, Anastasiades even spoke on Turkey's participation in the energy planning 
in of the region when the settlement was achieved and this is very important for the first time greeks and even greek cypriots are giving some positive signs of it uh, and i see erdogan's tune or or, or the narrative is getting ma- more and more uh, cooperative in terms of uh, his political scheme and we are going to the elections in turkey uh, therefore whether it is a normalization or, or zero problem with neighbors because you know zero problem with neighbors uh, is is an issue not only in turkey but in, in our partners as well uh, but we need to define a new new narrative and it is the time i guess uh, to define this narrative new narrative Thank you, Mitata. And uh, I would like to know from a U.S. perspective, uh, how do the U.S. Uh, see these uh, um, changes in uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy, this uh, cooperative uh, attitude? Dr. Flanagan. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I think uh, the, I think the, it remains to be seen uh, how Washington is perceiving this. Uh, there's still a number of developments that need, need to unfold. Uh, in the first place, uh, it seems to me that uh, in the face of the brutality of Russian aggression in the Black Sea region, Turkey's um, uh, sort of prevailing uh, strategy that it could take the lead more or less on its own uh, with some limited help from its NATO allies in managing security in the Black Sea region is, is not very viable. Uh, and particularly if Russia ends up controlling a good part of Ukraine's coastline on the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, uh, it would only enhance the, uh, uh, the threat that it could be posed to NATO allies and partners in the region. And so it could be that this would lead Turkey to take a more balanced approach to advancing its interest in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea. In other words, would it lead to perhaps, uh, as it rebalances its own strategy to focus a bit more on threats in the Black Sea, uh, might it lead to a less confrontational posture towards Greece and and other countries in the Mediterranean concerning its maritime claims there? I I think that's a a question. I I don't know that there's yet an answer. On the other hand, at the same time, uh, I think there is a a sense uh, that as we watch the war unfold in Ukraine, the sense of Russia's, uh, in, uh, you know, enorm- the, 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 Ru- the Russian military machine has taken a, a bit of a knock and the sense that, that Russia was almost invincible uh, in the use of its military power in the region uh, is also coming a bit into question uh, as it see- meets with this robust Ukrainian resistance uh, and is not, uh, you know, fully able to use all of its maritime power in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in suborning uh, uh, Ukrainian territory. So it, it may be that there, that there will be a sense in Turkey that, well, perhaps Russia isn't so formidable and that, and that we, we can still play this role of, uh, of, of taking the lead for NATO, even as we try to avoid a further, uh, a further use of Russian military force against our interests. Uh, another factor that will also, I think, impact uh, Turkey's approach to Black Sea security may be uh, how it develops its own energy security posture. Uh, development, uh, if it does uh, continue to develop the energy, um, the gas finds that it has on its own Black Sea coast and tries to wean perhaps itself from dependence on Russian imported gas, uh, that may also play a role in in Turkey's uh, strategy. And I think uh, in terms of uh, NATO, uh, NATO certainly recognizes that the Turkish uh, the Turkish armed forces, as Professor Çalıkpala remain uh, the second largest in in NATO overall. Uh, there's a, a recognition that the Turkish Navy is undertaking a sizable modernization effort under the National Ship Program, uh, 15 ships and submarines being planned, including this Anadolu, this very large multi-purpose, multi-purpose amphibious ship that will provide improved uh, power projection capability. So Turkey could play uh, this uh, more important role, both in, uh, in uh, ensuring Black Sea security for NATO allies and, 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 and supporting partners, but also uh, uh, but, uh, playing a role, uh, you know, potentially a more constructive role uh, further afield, including in, in the Gulf and uh, in parts of the Mediterranean. But again, that, that remains to be seen in terms of uh, a number of, um, of policy decisions. But then there's uh, sort of the question of, well, what might a Turkish government, either under President Erdogan or a future government, uh, want uh, for taking uh, this more constructive uh, approach or a firmer, uh, a more constructive approach in the Eastern Mediterranean or a firmer stance against Russia in the Black Sea. 
Um, certainly, I think that uh, some uh, lifting of the restrictions uh, uh, that are currently in place, the sanctions on Turkish defense industry and, and uh, restraints on security assistance. Uh, Turkey has, as you know, been seeking uh, uh, support if, if it Uh, having been excluded from the F-35 program, um, it's sought to uh, achieve uh, some support from the United States for modernizing its existing F-16 uh, fighter program uh, and upgrade and perhaps procuring some additional. Uh, but it might also want to see uh, itself uh, reintegrated into the F-35 program, uh, particularly if it, if it plays this uh, more constructive role uh, in regional security. NATO has made this decision now to establish these um, uh, additional presence in Southeastern Europe, uh, the battle groups, uh, both uh, in Romania and Bulgaria. Turkey had been contributing um, to the headquarters staff of the Southeast European, uh, the NATO Southeast European Brigade uh, in, in Romania. Uh, would it uh, take a role in, uh, in supporting that going forward? That would be another indicator of the kind of posture that Turkey wants to play. Uh, in uh, being uh, this reliable uh, or casting itself as this more reliable ally uh, and less, a less difficult ally uh, in, in uh, promoting security in the region. So again, I don't have any firm answers yet, but, but certainly a number of questions and opportunities that I hope we can explore in the question and answer. So thank you. Thank you very, uh, very much. And uh, I turn uh, to, to Alina to ask what could be the consequences of changes in the balance of power in the Black Sea on regional cooperation initiatives? Um, yeah, I have to start by, by admitting that regional cooperation initiatives in the Black Sea have been traditionally weak. Um, but that wasn't only necessarily because of Russia's opposition to, to these initiatives. Turkey from time to time uh, was opposing them as well. And in general, it just been the dynamics of cooperation around the Black Sea and in the Black Sea um, has been very different from the dynamic of co uh, cooperation, for example, in the Baltic Sea, where, uh, where uh, the, the, the literal states are much closer in, 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 in cooperating with each other and in coming up with, uh, with joint initiatives. Um, would the balance of would the change of balance of power change these dynamics? It depends. It depends on what kind of solution to the conflict we are looking at. Um, if we are going to have a truce, which means that that's all we can achieve, um, but the regional, but the security is, instability will still be there through the frozen conflicts, uh, through possible yet again um, um, open conflicts in the um, in the near future. So again, if we are only going to have a truce with instability continuing in the Black Sea, well, then I don't I don't think that the uh, regional that regional cooperation is going to get any more ground than it has in the um, in the past, maybe even less. Um, if on the contrary we are looking at a peace which is going a peace a long lasting peace. Um, which is going to bring with it stability, security stability, um, then I think that, uh, yes, indeed, regional cooperation on different areas, on different uh, uh, issues, on different platforms could, uh, could, could get off the ground much better than it has in the past. There is one caveat that I have, or there is one thing which I, uh, which I need to mention. Um, I was referring to, region, to regional cooperation, to governmental regional cooperation. Uh, when it comes to uh, non-governmental regional cooperation, second track, um, or even business, business regional cooperation, things are a little bit better. Uh, but that is only because there has been um, um, a, a very conscious and substantial effort um, on behalf of the United States or European Union, United States more, uh, to actually enhance and catalyze this, uh, this cooperation. But everything I was saying in the beginning was very, very much referring to the, to the uh, governmental cooperation. Thank you, Alina. Uh, a quick question uh, that um, has been raised in, uh, in the Italian debate in these days. What kind of leverage can Turkey have on, uh, on Russia uh, to, um, to achieve uh, a, cease, uh, a ceasefire, if there is any? Uh, I don't know who this is. 
question is referred to? Uh, 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 to you, uh, please. Now, um, okay. Um, I'm not sure Turkey has a lot of leverage over Russia in, in, in achieving the ceasefire, and I'm, I'm very happy that you used the word ceasefire and not achieving peace. Um, I, I think President Erdogan is doing everything that he can to use to offer this platform for negotiation, but I cannot see at this point, and Mita, Stephen, please contradict me if I'm wrong, uh, what leverage Turkey can actually, can actually have on Russia to, to convince it, persuade it. To, uh, to cease fire. But again, I would be very interested myself in what Mitata or Stephen have to, would have to answer this question. Please, Mitata and uh, Steve. Yeah, I agree with Alina that if there's a, a leverage um, to, in Turkey's hands against Russia or, or not, and there's no leverage. The leverage is Turkey's Western connections. You know, Turkey is the NATO member, only NATO member country who is not part of sanctions and the Western partners, especially NATO member countries, let Turkey to play this balancing act uh, against Russia. And this time, most probably Turkey gets a kind of a uh, permission in court from the Western actors to try to play with Russia to normalize its attitude. You know, uh, for example, what Erdogan government is expecting from the West is, is, is realize he's getting the end results just after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. All the Western leaders has just started to visit Ankara and try to uh, establish some better links with the, 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 the Turkish government, try to uh, show some ways and let Turkey to create a kind of a uh, space to negotiate uh, and to resolve the issue between the parties. And this is the case, and Turkey's leverage is, Turkey has a, has a kind of an experience to deal with Russia in the Caucasus, in Syria, and at the end in U Ukraine. Whether it's a leverage or not, I don't know. But you know, Turkey managed to play the card with the Russians, despite all those negativities and the issues. And it seems that both leaders, I mean Erdogan and Putin, uh, time to time, listen to each other. Of course, it's not easy to 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 control Putin under the current circumstances. But you know, the main leverage is, of course, the Western sanctions on Russia over Russia, and Russians are facing with those issues. And then I see some uh, other kind of oligarchs. They are playing in between Turkey, uh, Ukraine, and of course the West and Russia. Uh, to find some resolution of the issue, whether it's a truce or a kind of a, a settlement, a permanent settlement. But, you know, this is very early and Turkey showed itself as a kind of a much more moderate Western actor against Russian uh, uh, expectations. Maybe this is the only leverage, but beyond that, I don't see any leverage because, you know, this is a serious case for Turkey. You know, uh, after a COVID environment or COVID effects, Turkey would like to normalize its economic conditions and try to invite or expect uh, much Russian and Ukrainian tourists and try to find some extra cheap energy resources. All those stories are out of equation now. Uh, and Turkey's trade with the US and Ukraine and, and, and Russia is, is a kind of an under heavy pressure. And this is also negatively affects Turkey's under severe economic conditions as well. Therefore, I don't see any leverage in the ends of Erdogan, but just good intentions and friendly relations to, to, to support the parties. This is it, I guess. So the, the personal uh, relationship uh, between uh, Erdogan and Putin could be an asset, but not a leverage. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I could, if I could, I might offer just a, a brief dissent. I agree with what both my colleagues have said broadly, but I do think at a time when the Russian military is uh, finding itself uh, uh, in a situation that it, it's, uh, it's, it's, its war plans in Ukraine have been stymied in part because of some of the security assistance that Turkey has provided, uh, that it does leave, it doesn't, it means that Tur and Turkey has, from all reports, it's not acknowledged it always, but uh, has continued to provide some of these uh, TB2 attack drones uh, to the Ukrainians, even in the midst of the conflict. 
Russia knows that, uh, that Turkey has that capacity to sort of up the ante a bit more. Uh, whether it will choose to play that card is, it remains to be seen. But, but I do think that, uh, it, it, again, it's part of this balancing. It's shown a firmness uh, uh, to continue that security assistance to Ukraine. And uh, as Professor Chalipala alluded to, it challenged Russia indirectly uh, in support for the uh, Azerbaijanis in, uh, in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And it's also damaged Russian influence, interest in Libya uh, recently uh, by uh, taking some forceful action in support of the GNA. So I, I think that it's true the balance of power is largely with Moscow, but Turkey's role in NATO and the ability to sort of raise that, the, the, raise the, the volume or the, uh, the, the level of heat uh, that it can exercise as a NATO ally and, and what it might allow its NATO partners to do it is a lever that Turkey can uh, can have even even as it's playing this role of, of peacemaker or at least a ceasefire broker, as Alina rightly said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we received some uh, some questions from uh, from the audience. I uh, read the, the first one. How does the war in Ukraine affect Greek Turkish relations to NATO allies? concerning the disputed maritime zones in uh, uh, the Aegean area, in the Aegean uh, Sea. Mitat, maybe you would like to, to answer the, this question. A couple of points that I would like to raise. First of all, you know, uh, Turkey and Greece has just already started to, to discuss some issues. Of course, there is no win-win formula or the uh, the, the resolution of those issues, they are all issues. Uh, maybe the Turkish Greek reconciliatory talks can be considered an early uh, promising issue. And, and more than that, uh, you know, this is a, a, a crazy environment and it, it, it works negatively. Uh, and Greece and Greek Cypriots are the members of the EU, Turkey is not. And you know, under such and heavy conditions, this, this membership affects the, both of those countries' policies and stance. But on the other hand, Turkey is a negotiating partner. Therefore, try to bring Turkey in a, a much greater bubble to, to, to discuss different issues. Uh, and therefore, any kind of an issue, bringing the parties together uh, uh, with the, under the circumstances of a, a, a joint threat, which is Russian expansionism in this case, affects very positively. Uh, and then from then on, most probably we may get together. And you know, for Turkey and the Greece, the, the, the alternative of this peaceful means is locking horns and to compete with each other. And it doesn't contribute very positively to the parties. And the, the European partners most probably try to uh, strengthen the the, the 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 friendship and solidarity within EU and as well as NATO, and then any kind of a disagreement negatively affects the mood of Western uh, solidarity. And then the parties most probably may decide to locate Turkey in this equation. And if the Greeks uh, started to locate Turkey as a partner and friendly country, and start to negotiate those issues, most probably it may affect very positively. And there are some ways and means. We have an experience in 1990s, late 1990s. In 1999, uh, with the support of European and uh, US, uh, especially, Turkey and Greece kept together and has just started some warm relations. Therefore, the environment is suitable now. And then we may forward uh, from this point of view. This is the effect of Russian aggression and the parties has just started to uh, get together and try to find some positive ways. They, are, they do not want to be um, another headache to other uh, partners within NATO and the EU. This is the case maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Mitat. There's another, another question. Uh, to what extent could the economic impact of the war uh, in Ukraine affect uh, Erdogan's domestic popularity and uh, its difficult balancing act with, uh, uh, with Russia. Alina, this question is to you. 
Well, thank you, but I'm not an expert on domestic on Turkish domestic politics and economy, so I would refer this to Mitat instead. So, Mitat or maybe, even uh, maybe, uh, Dr. Flanagan. Yeah, just just a starting point. I may say some some issues, Valeria and uh, Dr. Flanagan at this issue as well. You know. Uh, Turkey is under heavy economic conditions, you know, especially parity is very negatively affecting uh, the, 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 the ordinary people and energy prices are the, the epicenter of this issue uh, more than that the food security is under heavy threat just because of the war. Uh, Turkey's trade volume with Russia just increased uh, the pre, how can I say, 20 uh, 10, 20, 15 period. It's around uh, 30, 32 billion US dollars. And Turkey's trade volume with Ukraine is around 10 billion US dollars. And it stopped very quickly. We have no trade at all with Ukraine. And we lost this amount. And Turkish Russian trade volume decreasing very severely. And this is also a concern for Turkey. And we don't know the, the nature of sanctions in the coming future. If it affects the uh, energy related issues, then it may have some serious effect on Turkey as well. And we need to think uh, this, this nuclear condition and nuclear facility as well. And Russians uh, will uh, finish it next year. And most probably they're expecting to be operational at the end of 2023. And it's an also domestic issue for Turkey. More than that, Turkey is expecting more tourists, uh, double from the last year. And the first two countries who sent tourists to Turkey, the first one is Russia, and the second one is Ukraine. Under heavy conditions of the war, it's almost impossible to attract those tourists to Turkey. This is also an issue. Uh, and therefore, we are losing the environment and Turkey needs to spend huge amount of money for the security needs. And we know what's happening in Syria, in the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as in the Caucasus. And the addition, which means the Black Sea region, to this equation ruins Erdogan's economic and financial plans as well. And under those circumstances, it's almost impossible to attract foreign investment in Turkey just because of the war environment. This is also an, another negative effect of the, the war on Turkish economy. These are the, the, the first points that I, uh, I may raise and maybe Mr. Flanagan as well to add some issues. Uh, from the economy perspective. I think Professor Chalikpala covered those uh, the key points very well. I was going to just speculate, though, on uh, the loss of the Ukraine uh, market and investments for Russia, uh, for, for, uh, for Turkey, is, is, uh, is critical. Uh, and in terms of its long-term recovery, and I've been musing uh, as the peace, uh, the, the, the discussions on the ceasefire go ahead, uh, in Istanbul, that whether Turkey might also see this as an opportunity to play a role in the reconstruction of Ukraine uh, over the longer term, that it's, uh, that it's solidarity with Ukraine during and before the war, uh, its concerns about other investments and, and some mutually beneficial uh, activities, uh, you know, not, uh, not only in defense industry, which, which I think was very much a mutually beneficial relationship before the war that Turkey has now uh, also lost. Uh, but other aspects of, of cooperation uh, that uh, that could be important to uh, both Turkey's economic uh, stabilization and and uh, and the reconstruction of Ukraine. So that that would be an interesting uh, air, area of activity to watch. Uh, and of course, Turkey wouldn't necessarily have the resources, but if there were some major international assistance program, uh, including perhaps from states outside the region, not just the EU and the United States. For reconstruction of, of the damage in Ukraine, um, that that could provide Turkey with an opening that uh, that it could say that its its knowledge and capacity in the region uh, could be applied as as a as an effort at uh, enhancing longer term stability and, and economic recovery in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time to take uh, two more uh, questions from uh, from the audience. And the first one uh, relates uh, to uh, the energy cooperation between Turkey and uh, Israel. And the question is, uh, how viable is this uh, energy cooperation uh, given the political notes that still exist between Israel and uh, Turkey? And uh, uh, considering also Cyprus' uh, opposition to this uh, issue. 
would like to, to pick this, uh, this question. I may say some points again. Uh, you know, Turkish-Israeli relations is, is, is bigger than this energy topic. Of course, energy is a kind of a uh, contribution to normalize relations, it's a positive uh, catalyst to move forward for the parties. But, you know, it's a broader issue. Uh, Turkey is in need of energy resources, like the other European uh, countries and nations. Uh, of course, for the moment, Russia is a partner and Turkey has good relations with Azerbaijan and said there's a possibility to, to have uh, Iranian gas uh, as well as uh, if the, the conditions are uh, suitable, we may attract uh, Iraqi and the other options as well. But, you know, uh, Eastern Mediterranean in general, not only Israel, but Egyptian and, of course, Cypriot resources are very important for Turkey to, to diversify Turkey's energy mix and to support Turkey's economy. I don't know whether they are going to be uh, cheap or, or much more resourceful, but, you know, it's not easy. Uh, but Turkey needs Israel and other Eastern Mediterranean partners to cooperate with, not only for energy resources, but to normalize its relations with the other actor, uh, uh, actors as well. Because tense Israeli-Turkish relations affects Turkey's relations with the U.S. and the EU as well. Therefore, energy may be a kind of a starter, as it was a kind of a starter to, to conflict with the parties, uh, for Turkey to normalize and to cooperate for the further developments. But, you know, it's not an only an, an enough topic or the issue to normalize the both parties' relations. But it's a good start or a catalyst to start with. It's a, it's a, it's a good start and it's a, um, energy is a, a hot issue in this day, above all, for, uh, for Europe. So yeah. uh, the di diversification of energy supply is a, a crucial issue for, uh, for uh, European uh, countries at this very moment. And that's why uh, Eastern Mediterranean uh, gas resources uh, are uh, uh, emerging as crucial, as a, a good alternative for, uh, for, for Europe. Also, uh, for example, the project, the East Med uh, pipeline, uh, was considered not, uh, not viable uh, yeah. by, from the US uh, recently in January. The U.S. Uh, decided to drop out this uh, this this project, and there is a very uh, la last question uh, about um, the implication of uh, uh, the war in Ukraine uh, on a Middle Eastern crisis, in which uh, both uh, Turkey and Russia are involved, such as uh, Syria and uh, Libya. So uh, what are the scenarios? For example, for, for Syria, Dr. Flanagan. Well, I think Syria certainly remains an important point of Russian leverage uh, in tempering Turkish behavior vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis perhaps, you know, uh, both in the Black Sea and, and elsewhere. Uh, on the other hand, at a time when the, the, the uh, Russian military is stretched uh, in its operations in Ukraine, I'm, I'm not so sure that it would uh, undertake further punitive actions uh, or it would, it would be risky to take further uh, actions that would be seen as, as countering Turkish interests in, in Idlib and elsewhere in, uh, in, in northern Syria, although they certainly have have had had come to blows before, of course, in the incident with you know the um, uh, so-called so in, in inadvertent bombing of, of Turkish soldiers by the Russians uh, in Idlib in, in early 2020. So, uh, I do think that remains uh, a, a possibility for, for to Russia to certainly try to raise the heat there, but it but it would come with some risks because uh, it, it, it you know Turkey is not bogged down in a war uh, the way the Russians are right now. In Libya, I do think too that uh, Turkey's continued. Uh, support uh, for the, the GNA and others, uh, you know, is working against Russian interests. But again, Russia is in no position right now. It seems to me to uh, to try to um, exercise any any further 
um, after, but uh, just to I make a brief comment on your on the earlier point, though, I, I do think that one of the other things that will be interesting is to see uh, Turkey uh, as this remarkable uh, shift in relations with Israel and some of the Gulf states, uh, Turkey not wanting to be left out of that, uh, and how that might impact its relationships uh, both with uh, with Israel and some of the other Gulf states uh, in trying to uh, be seen as being part of this uh, this new. Um, uh, this new uh, strategic landscape that's that's evolving uh, in in the the, the, the Gulf uh, and in particularly the sort of the United Front against uh, against Iran uh, that Turkey may not want to miss out on. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, to ask uh, Alina and Mitat uh, if the, uh, you would like to add something on on this point on the crisis. Um. I, I would like to add something on, on, on the point that you asked about the impact of economic, uh, um, the economic impact um, on the domestic policy of, um, of Turkey. Um, and I think we have to enlarge the context a little bit. Of course, the question is very valid and Mitat has answered it uh, very, very well. And everybody expects that the harshening of the of further harshening of the conditions, economic conditions in Turkey would give Erdogan a lot of headache to put it this way. But we have to enlarge the context and look at the fact that the same thing applies not only to Turkey, it applies to pretty much all of the European countries. Um, of course, Turkey is in a weaker state because of its, its economy and the high inflation that it's, it's, uh, it's fighting. But we have to ask the same question to the other, uh, to the other European countries, as I was saying, um, and the impact, the social impact that we have to deal with and how this will affect the policies in the end that we want to have uh, towards countries which would uh, want to, to exit the European Union, uh, but also how much stamina, resistance, and um, um, we will have to, to, to carry on the, um, the war, the current war. Thank you very much, Alina. Yeah, of course, yeah, it's too early. It's uncertain. We don't know how Russia treat and position itself in, in Syria after those events in the north will normalize or, or, or settled. If it is settled, uh, we know that they, they 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 have many issues. But you know, Turkey's priorities are concentrated on uh, PKK and of affiliates in Syria and other regions, and most probably. Turkey is in need of establishing relations at the end with Damascus, uh, one way or another, to normalize its relations within the entire region, not only in Syria, but in the Middle East and as well as Eastern Mediterranean. And this might be a part of it. And there are rumors, at, at, at least some signs, that uh, some lower level uh, contacts are prevailing over. And if it works, then there is no need to have Russia. And for Libya, most probably Turkey prefers to work together with the European partners and the US. If Turkey or Ankara finds some, some green light uh, from its traditional partners in, in terms of all those issues, most probably it moves towards those, those directions. Uh, let's, let's wait for, for what's happening in, in Syria, uh, in, in Ukraine, and then afterwards, most probably we may uh, comment on Turkey's relations with Russia and Iran in terms of uh, resolution of issues in Syria and, and other regions, Middle Eastern regions. Thank you very much, Mitat. So we will organize another uh, panel, another event to discuss <laughs> about, uh, about this. We get to the end of this very interesting the, the discussion, and I would like to thank you for uh, your uh, insightful uh, contribution and, uh, and analysis. I wish you a very good uh, evening and uh, thanks again uh, for being with us uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. Thank you very much.